Peter Yehan is an Irish investigative reporter, I think it's fair to say, who lives in, or perhaps with his new job, not less so, two places, London and Glasgow, and has researched his stories in many countries around the world. Last year, he became editor-in-chief at Open Democracy, he led the investigative reporting as editor of investigations. He's also the author of two books. The first is called The People's Referendum, Why Scotland Will Never Be the Same Again, which was published in 2014. And more recently, and in a sense the book that enticed us to invite him to come and talk to us, Democracy for Sale, Dark Money and Dirty Politics, which was published in 2020. It's the realities described in the latter book, which Peter will, I think, be talking about now, and also bringing forward, perhaps, into things he's, he's found in pursuing these questions in open democracy in more recent months. So this is our, this is our concern. This is why we gave ourselves the title Dark Money and the Subversion of Global Politics. And I just personally, for me, one of the questions here is what link can we find between Peter's analysis of this movement of dark money, this new form of political persuasion and uh, manipulation, because that is what we're dealing with, and the sorts of narratives that uh, Norman Cohn was interested in developing a critical argument about. So in a, what we will do, I think, is we will hear from Peter, um, and then we will have a conversation in which we might try and explore the common territory. And we will, of course, start up here, but we will open to the audience, and we will also be taking questions from the live feed. So thank you for listening to our introductory material. I'll now hand over to Peter and sit here and listen. Thank you. Thank you very much, Patrick. I was going to stand up, but you're also close to me. It, feel, it would feel a bit weird if I stuck uh, projected to the back of the room with the wine glasses. So I think, uh, oh, is that a bit echoey? Oh, is that okay? Um, maybe I'll, I'll try not to speak so loud, which just doesn't come easily to me. Um, First of all, many thanks to Norman Cohn Trust and the Centre for the Critical Study of Apocalyptic and Millenarian Movements. Not least because your centre sounds so absolutely cool. Like, I feel really blessed to have you talking about it. Like, it sounds really, really, really interesting. And I'm quite looking forward to us exploring some of Norman Cohn's ideas. But, you know, I'm not massively familiar with, with him, but actually I've been really struck with, or I talk to people about him. His work actually certainly permeates other people. I'm quite interested in even saying I was doing this lecture. People are like, oh, I used to read his work in college and stuff like that. And, and I'm sure we will, we will probably dig into conversation more into the kind of the, 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 the more kind of subcutaneous relationships between these things. But the one thing that did strike me was I know that Norman Cohn was very interested in kind of very, very fanatically into stuff. And, and I guess there's a bit of fanaticism in my work because as an investigative journalist, you are like kind of always being slightly fanatical about things. So people watch all the president's men, they think that investigative journalism is kind of skulking around in car parks and, and meeting people and things like that, and kind of shouting, you know, stop the press uh, at you know, five minutes to, to, to midnight. And the reality, in some ways, at least in my experience, is quite different. I don't know if you've ever seen um, the film Spotlight, uh, which is a film about clerical abuse uh, in, in Boston. And it's my favourite film about journalism because it's probably the closest to what it's like to do what I do which is you spend hours and hours and days and days and weeks and weeks kind of slowly, slowly, slowly picking away at something. And then you have some sort of eureka moment where it all comes together. But you have to be slowly, slowly, fanatically following a thread for, for it ever to lead anywhere. And it's, it's kind of a grind at times. And it, it requires a kind of, uh, I think, a kind of a, 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 an ability not to let go of something or at least a, 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 a kind of a compulsion not to let go of something. Um, and often it means you start your investigations in quite unglamorous places or surprising places. And the genesis of this book started in a very surprising place. In some respects, I'm still amazed that the book exists. It actually started um, back in a place at Seaburn Metro Station on the outskirts of Sunderland on the 21st of June, 2016. Um, and when I first started doing this, 21st of June, 2016, it was... It was uh, two days before the Brexit referendum, and I was working as a reporter for uh, the Irish Times. And my editor did that thing that newspaper editors do before a big vote. They send the reporters to parts of the country that they've never really heard of, the reporter hasn't heard of either. And they spend the day wandering around talking to people, and then they write this definitive piece about what life is like in X, Y, or Z. So I was sent to, I was sent to Sunderland to report on voters talk about the European Union just before the Brexit referendum. 
Uh, and fair to say they weren't particularly fussed on the European Union in Sunderland just before the Brexit referendum. By the next morning I was getting ready to leave and I, my kind of train came into the platform and I just got the train and, and next to me was a copy of the Metro, the newspaper, the free the Metro newspaper, the free street. And the Metro had a big wraparound advert on it that said, take back control, vote leave, which, you know, the catchy leave slogan from 2016, it's still a hit now. It had like a little imprint that said, paid for by the Democratic Unionist Party. And I found this very curious, because I used to work as a reporter in Northern Ireland, and I knew a lot about the DUP. I knew that the DUP were not, uh, you know, they were 50 years, almost 50 years old, they never ran a single candidate outside of Northern Ireland. They weren't a political party known for great largesse in election spending, you know, the, some of the uh, Presbyterian parsimony, but you know, there was no sense that the DUP were, were big spenders at election time. And I was really struck they were buying this huge expensive ad in the Metro newspaper, so I was like, what was going on? And I also knew something else because I used to work as a reporter in Belfast and I knew the political donations in Northern Ireland were kept secret under a kind of um, a law dating back to the Troubles because there was a fear that if people were found to have been given political donations, they could be subject to intimidation, threats or worse. So I was kind of wondering, you know, has someone done something, had someone tried to use Northern Ireland's anachronistic laws to get around election spending and I took a little photograph and I posted it on Twitter and that kind of was the end of it, you know, I kind of, the train took off, we went past the kind of, uh, the bits of heavy industry that are left in Sunderland, and I started writing my uh, copy for the next day's newspaper. And 48 hours later, Sunderland voted overwhelmingly to leave the European Union. I think it was about 60% in, in Sunderland votes to leave. Within, you know, a couple of hours, David Cameron resigned, you know, everything moves on. And like the whole way along, uh, we had all the kind of pollsters and everybody else trying to explain what happened, the Brexit referendum. And in many ways, Britain for a number of years, maybe still since, has been kind of cauterized by that story. And I guess in, in the months that fo followed the Brexit re referendum result, I kind of found myself thinking about being back in that train station and that advert. I found myself kind of wondering just what was going on there? What was happening with it? You know, why was this political party buying these expensive ads? Like, who was paying for it all? Um, and what was interesting was it turned out that Adam Ramsey, who was a young reporter at Open Democracy, was asking the same questions. And he gave me a call in early 2017, and he was said, you know, like, you know, I'm really interested in this. And it's interesting because a few years later, I'm now the editor-in-chief at Open Democracy. I'm Adam's boss. He's still there. And I run a website that's dedicated to public interest journalism. It's all about challenging power and inspiring change. And it all involves digging deep to look at who's influ influencing our politics, who's influencing our democracy behind the scenes. And, you know, my first taste of working for Open Democracy was, was this story that Adam and I did. We started this investigation into the DUP's Brexit spending. And we discovered a lot of things. We discovered that the, the DUP had received £435,000, which is a huge amount of money in Northern Irish politics, for these adverts. And it had been routed through a strange little Scottish group called the Constitutional Research Council, which had been set up by a man who'd gone into business with the former head of Saudi secret intelligence. At times it felt a little bit like a kind of airport novel. Every time you pull the next thread, something kind of dr dramatic and remarkable happened. And this is a bit in the talk where I should always say that I st we still don't actually know where that £435,000 came from. So if anybody does know, feel free to come, come see me afterwards in confidence. You know, and everything, all sources will be treated confidentially. But anyway, so like what was interesting as well was, as I mentioned, this legislation in Northern Ireland. Actually, that loophole had technically been closed in 2014, but a successive uh, number of Conservative Northern Ireland secretaries had actually never enacted the legislation that was required. So the Northern Ireland donations were kept secret. And so we kept, we've published dozens and dozens of stories about, about this. Um, um, and eventually the loophole was closed, but uh, interestingly, they, they didn't, the Conservative Party at the time, if you remember, were relying on the Democratic Unionist Party in Parliament. They decided not to, to, as was easy to do, instead of using the legislation that existed, which would have made public all donations from 2014, they decided to make it just start from the time the new legislation came in, so we still don't know where the money came from. But I found myself, what was interesting about it, and perhaps because my background is investigative journalism, but I'd never actually done much work on money in politics. I'd done a lot of work on Things like, I used to work for Channel 4, consumer affairs, labor rights, those sorts of issues. And I think because I hadn't come from that background, I found this whole world absolutely fascinating. I was like, this is really interesting. Like, who are, if, oh, DUP is interesting, but more generally, like, what's the influence of money in our politics? You know, what's going on? And it's interesting because when it comes to political funding, Britain 
is, um, is a bit like the United States. It's private money that runs politics. Whereas in the European, in most of Europe, parties are funded by, by the state. But the difference between Britain and the United Kingdom is that in America, it's huge, big business. We all know how much money, and we, we, it's a huge business. I think you know, the 2018 midterm elections cost $6 billion. You know, there's, there's states with less annual turnover and a huge amounts of money. And I think that's really interesting, I think especially since I wrote this book, because you know, I think when I finished writing this book, there was a bit of me that went, have I gone too far? Have I been too unkind? And a lot of stuff that's happened in the last 12 months has made me go, no, no, you weren't, you weren't, you know, A, you were maybe right a bit too early, and, uh, you know, you could have been much, much less kind than you were. And the way I say that is because in Britain, um, actually, small amounts of money can make a huge difference, you know, because there's so little money. So for £50,000 a year, you can become a member of a thing called the Conservative Leaders Group, which means once every quarter you get to meet Boris Johnson if you want to, um, so... Some people like that kind of thing. Um, and his government ministers, and you can have off-the-record meetings and briefings with them where no notes were taken for £50,000. If you remember last, uh, not last summer, the summer before, there was a scandal to do with uh, Robert Jenrick, the then housing minister, and Richard Desmond, the Tory donor, who saved himself about £50 million when Robert Jenrick intervened in a planning decision to do with a major development in, in East London. The two men had met each other, sitting next to each other at a Tory party fundraiser. Uh, Richard Desmond had bought a table. That was £8,000. £8,000 gets you to sit next to a government minister and show him a video of your new development. You know, this is not huge amounts of money. It's almost in the scope of we all clubbed together. We could maybe you know, buy a minister for an hour or two. And the other, the other thing that struck me, that's, and I think is really interesting, is how the nature of political donations in Britain has changed a hell of a lot. So back in like the early 1970s, there was a lot of the asset strippers who championed um, Ted Heath's conservative leadership, but they were very different from the kind of City of London privatisation crowd that kind of rode in behind Margaret Thatcher. Uh, hilariously, in those days, in the 80s, Lord McAlpine, who, who is now passed away, so I can say this, he revolutionised Tory funding, and he reportedly used to wander around the City of London with a bag for cash, and you just put money in it. Um, and remarkably, that wasn't illegal at the time. That was totally fine. And by 20, 2011, when the Tories came back into power under David Cameron, they became really, they were really reliant on the City of London. City of London money was a big, big thing for the Tory parties, where most, about half of their funding came from the City of London. And what's interesting is that after the Brexit referendum, party funding has changed a lot in Britain, and particularly for the Conservative Party. Because the pro-business elite that kind of were broadly in favour of remaining in the European Union just left the Tory party in droves as the likes of the European Research Group became more powerful. And the Tories have also become more reliant on money uh, connected to Russia. So people like Lubov Chernukin, whose, whose husband was a finance minister under Vladimir Putin, she's given more than £2 million to the party since 2012. Um, so you see a lot of, like, kind of, the Tory party has also become increasingly reliant on pro-leave hedge fund, people from the hedge fund world, and this might be something you return to, where they're quite in, people who've, who have vested interest in disorganised capital. Yeah, and Jacob Rees-Mogg, I think, is, is a really interesting figurehead for that, and uh, his father even more so, and some of his father's writings on, on, on what the future might look like, I think, do chime with some of uh, uh, Norman Cole and, and, and the kind of people who are interested in, in apocalyptic visions and millenarian visions. And what's also interesting was that um, the Tory party's funding after Brexit was like a stock market, whatever, which was like kind of negatively cor correlated with, with um, the party's Brexit part policy at any given time. So if you remember back all those years ago in early 2019 when Theresa May was all those meaningful votes, oh my word, all the meaningful votes, um, and at that stage the party's donations went off a cliff. They fell by about half from the previous quarter because the donors didn't like this. They wanted a hard Brexit. And then when Boris Johnson became Prime Minister, they all came rolling back in. And there's an interesting question about what happens to politics when it becomes captured by small amounts of private money. And we only have to look at America in that respect to see it, because a lot of American donations do come from a handful of very rich people. You've seen the likes of the Koch brothers, uh, one of whom is now dead, um, the oil and gas billionaires who massively bankrolled American politics, spending billions of pounds over about 50 years. They funded politicians, they funded kind of shadowy think tanks, they funded, you know, lots of lobby groups. Um, 
you know, all the kind of lobby on issues like why climate change isn't really a big deal, why low taxes are good for the poor, lots of kind of counterintuitive proposals that none, nonetheless, uh, similarly with the gun lobby, which unfortunately is, is still a huge part of American politics. And so money does give donors a chance, I think, to like kind of set the direction of politics and where it goes, to lobby, you know, to say we want lower taxes. But political donations can also have quite direct material benefits or f for the donors. And I spent most of 2020 investigating various aspects of Britain's COVID response, and especially the kind of private contract, the public contracts went to private firms. And I'm sure you no doubt remember when the pandemic hit, there was a huge push to procure PPE, um, personal protective equipment, as quickly as possible. And the government sent out a call saying, anybody who can help us. So I sort of been quite interested in this because government contracts were kind of being handed out very quickly. All the normal rules of procurement were going out the window. And so I started off trying to understand how contracting works because it wasn't something I knew much about. And I spoke to lots of experts who talked me through the process, showed me how the system worked. I kind of, you know, used the government portal, which is quite glitchy, but to try and understand what was happening. Like who was being hired to run Britain's COVID response? And over the months that followed, I wrote dozens and dozens of articles about COVID contracting. I think the thing that struck me most was that like, Britain's first response in this difficult, difficult situation, and ironically, I was actually in Ireland. I, was, I went back to Ireland with my mum, so I was kind of watching it from afar. And you could see the two countries kind of, kind of side by side. And I was really struck that in Britain, the first response for many people in power was to call on their corporate contacts and also people who they knew through through politics, through political donors to, to help. And, you know, in the first six months of the pandemic, Britain spent over, you know, a hundred billion, a uh, million pounds, a billion pounds on uh, response, huge amounts of money went on, on consultancy contracts. You know, for example, Circle was given hundreds of millions of pounds to run the track and trace system. You know, and, and actually it didn't run as probably being unfair because it just subcontracted it out to about 30 different companies. Um, who they were refusing to, to name, actually, when I used to FOI them. They said, we, we can't give you out that because it's commercially sensitive, which is quite bizarre. But I spoke to lots of people who were working in this area as well, some of the contract tracers and kind of finding out what their lives was like. And what was quite a striking was Circo is a very well-connected, politically connected company as well. The company CEO is a grandson of Winston Churchill, a health minister at the time, he used to be a Circo lobbyist. And the more I looked at this, the more I saw that this kind of revolving door between politics, between public life and private life in the UK was, was completely inter interconnected. And I thought, you know, COVID, I think, for me, revealed the kind of depth of this cronyism and this clientelism in British public life. And that's not really my own opinion. Like, the, the government's own spending watchdog, the National Audit Office, did a report in which it found that what they called politically connected firms were 10 times more likely to get a government contract. And if you were put in this VIP lane, you know, basically you were, you were kind of quids in. And the sums involved were huge. You know, there's one, one business was owned by a conservative donor that supplied beauty products to high street chains and was given £65 million contract to provide face masks to the NHS, which is quite a good return. A conservative councillor in Stroud, who ran a small loss-making firm, was given £270 million to supply PPE. Uh, there was a strange case of Ianda Capital, which was a family investment that specialised in currency trading and offshore property. They were given £252 million to provide face masks, £50 million of which were never used because of design flaws. And the list goes on. I could sit here for the next hour reading names of companies like that. And actually, one day in, in the summer of 2020, um, I was doing what I often do in a slightly uh, fanatical way, which is trawling through government transparency releases. And I noticed that a PR firm called Public First had been given a contract for COVID by the Cabinet Office. And I knew Public First because it was run by two long-term associates of, of Michael Gove and Dominic Cummings, who at the time was not persona non grata in, in Downing Street, but very much the man at the helm. Um, and I'd been given contracts worth more than a million pounds without a tender. And on the back of the, my story, which I did with The Guardian, a court case actually was, was taken against Public First by the Good Law Project. And uh, Matt Hancock was found to have broken the law. And Matt Hancock resigned, but he didn't resign for that. Uh, he resigned because, if you remember, he was, he was caught in an amorous embrace with one of his colleagues. So that's, that's a big no-no, but giving contracts to your mates is pretty much okay. Um, I'm almost finished 
kind of some, some aspects of this of my talk, but I, I kind of would like to turn before we, myself and Patrick speak more to the kind of second part of my title, this idea of the subversion of global politics, because I think I've spoken a bit about the subversion, I think, of our politics here in Britain, our politics that happens just down the road, but I think there's a global aspect to all this that's really important. And I think what's really struck me in doing the work I do is just how globally connected so many of the aspects of this dark money problem are. You know, one aspect of it is what I'd almost call the dark money playbook. You know, the way electoral rules are abused, the way online adverts are used to push misinformation and disinformation, the way in which, frankly, bad actors will take every advantage that they can to, uh, to, um, to funnel money anonymously into the political system. Um, and so there's that aspect of, which you can see in lots of different jurisdictions, and there's connections between all around the world when it comes to that. And there's also quite material connections between some of the players in, in, in the, that I write about. You know, one of the things, the, probably the, the chapters I found most interesting when I was researching and writing my book were the sections in the middle, which is about the think tank world, the world of kind of anonymously funded think tanks. Most of which actually, there's hundreds of them, are based in um, two Georgian tenement houses um, on um, Tufton Street, which is not far from here. You know, and there, you know, and the fact that there's hundreds of them in two, two buildings suggests that there isn't actually hundreds of organisations. There's hundreds of names, which is very much how this works. You set up nominally independent, sounding think tanks with names like the Institute of Economic Affairs, the Centre for Policy Studies, which really, you know, are not particular. You know, they it's, they sound like research institutes, but a lot of what they are producing uh, is, you know, they're funded by corporations, funded by corporate interests, and a lot of what they're producing would not qualify as research for Sensam or, or any of your uh, similar uh, uh, bodies. You know, and I think, and what's really interesting is the connection between these groups from around the world. There's the the, the Atlas Network, which kind of links. Um, a fascinating organization. has about 450 libertarian think tanks around the world linked together by this thing called the Atlas Network, um, which actually has its roots uh, here in London originally and was brought to America. And so there's a huge connection between the Heritage Foundation, the big think tanks of the American right, uh, and um, Britain, British think tanks. And a lot of these, all of these organizations, especially the Brexit process, I write in my book, my book isn't really about, it's not saying that Brexit was stolen or anything like that, but I think what's interesting about Brexit was it kind of probably hypercharged stuff that was already happening in British politics. And I think it also gave some groups like the IEAs of this world who were kind of marginal an opportunity to become front and center of the political world in a way that they hadn't been for a while. And it's striking, I think it's given an opportunity for them to, to kind of engage with each other the kind of conservative right, the European Research Group, and, and uh, people like that, and the, and the kind of aspects of the, the GOP in the States and the kind of uh, conservative world. But not just that as well, actually. In, um, in writing this book, I, I interviewed Steve Bannon, if you remember Steve Bannon, Donald Trump's um, impresario. And he was quite interesting, because pre prior to that, in one of my investigations early on, which is in the book, was into a guy called Aaron Banks, who was a big Brexit donor. And I, I uncovered emails between Aaron Banks kind of writing to Steve Bannon, begging him to help him get around British electoral laws to fundraise in the US. And so, and Steve Bannon was talk a lot about Nigel Farage. So it was very interesting talking to Steve Bannon for this book, actually. And you know, he's, uh, you know, he's he's clearly a, a character with a, with a story to tell and, and a, a particular worldview. But also, he is one of those people who's very much connected to all these different people. And he was talking to me actually about the importance of social media for populist movements, about how Matteo Salvini in Italy, Jair Bolsonaro in Brazil, Nigel Farage, even Trump wouldn't exist without these social, without, without social media. And we saw some of that during the American elections. We've seen huge amounts of spending by political parties on social media, but also the extent to which social media can warp and change political conversations. And I think it's really striking, this, you know, and Steve Bannon, when I spoke to him, really saw it. It's a great, you know, the, 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 what is un, unsurprising is, is the kind of internationalism of nationalists. You know, I think that's a big strike. That's not new. We saw that in the 30s as well. But it's quite interesting to see it's kind of got an almost social media age uh, aspect to it now. And we can see that, I think, in the connections between some of the groups that I write about in my book and international players. You know, Viktor Orban, who recently ran, won another landslide majority in, in uh, in Hungary, you know, we've seen conservative MPs, a number of conservative MPs go to, to give speeches, to go on um, 
talk about, uh, express their admiration for Orban's regime. We even saw a group of pro-Brexit libertarians, including Taxpayers Alliance and the Adam Smith Institute, lobbying to establish a museum of communist terror in London, which was inspired by uh, the kind of the Budapest attraction. There's a former Thatcher, Thatcher spin doctor, speechwriter, John O'Sullivan, who, who now works for Danube Institute in, in Budapest. There's kind of these personal links which run through it. And more recently, what I've become very interested in is I've noticed a lot of these same players have a new target. It's no longer Brexit. That, that ship has sailed in some respects. And it's opposing net zero and action on climate change. This has become a big aspect of this. And it's funny, I kind of... Um, I discovered this almost by chance about six or seven months ago, I, and I wrote a piece about it, which kind of went a bit viral, because I was looking at the Telegraph for my sins, and I noticed they had a, an advert, or not an advert, they had a story about how a majority of people wanted, in Britain wanted a referendum on net zero. I found this really odd. I'd never heard anybody talk about this. I was like, I wonder who's... I'm, I'm quite having... The one thing that my book and my research has told me is, is actually to be very sceptical about stories I read in the media. Um, <laughs> Because it's really easy to place stories, and it's often not in, out of badness. Journalists are not like, journalists of deadlines. It's a tough. I worked as a, in a newsroom for years. It's a tough environment, and I noticed this, uh, this uh, sto story about this polling that said that a majority of people want a referendum on net zero, and it was conducted by an organisation called Car Twenty Six. This is about a week before COP Twenty Six. So I, I went down to the company's house. I noticed that Car Twenty Six was only set up about three weeks earlier. And I noticed that one of the people who's the front woman for Car 26 was also a member of, um, I get confused between Reclaim and Renew and the various different ones, Lawrence Fox's political party, which is underwritten by a guy called Jeremy Hoskin, who was a big Brexit donor and spent about five million on this bizarre vanity project. Um, and I noticed that the polling had been conducted by another group, which was part of the Brexit campaign. And so, but within 24 hours, it was being debated on the BBC's politics show live. So, and it's so e that's the, how easy these, these things are to transmute from what was effectively, you know, maybe a £1,000 brought you the opinion polling. So it's so easy to, to kind of, um, kind of uh, influence our political debate. And subsequently, since, since then, Nigel Farage has announced he's going to set up a referendum, a campaign for a referendum on net zero. The European Research Group has morphed into the Net Zero Scrutiny Group of backbench MPs, or the exact same people, using the exact same tactics in many respects as the European Research Group of MPs did as well. And actually, earlier this month, myself and my, one of my colleagues at Open Democracy, we published an investigation to the Global Warming Policy Foundation, which has also kind of rebranded as Net Zero Watch. And we, we revealed that it had received um, funding from the US, from some of these big US. Almost all of its money comes from the US. Almost every penny the Global Warming Foundation, Policy Foundation gets comes from, uh, from the US, or over half of it. Um, and what's really striking, again, is that you know, in the, the kind of organizations we're giving money, with Richard Mellon Scaife's foundation, people like that, who spend hundreds of millions of dollars every year in America. And for a couple of hundred thousand dollars in the UK, would get huge amounts of media attention, traction, places in the media, conversation points, talking points in Parliament. And I think that's what has me still thinking that the, the title of my book, Democracy for Sale, is still probably quite relevant. Thank you very much. Thank you, Peter. I was... Um, well, let, let, let's, let's kind of come back to the question of code and see what we can do with it. Hmm. Um, I was intrigued by reading your book again. I realised how you're quite you're quite clear in a way that um, many, many, many of the people driving these systems that produce Brexit are really chasing a kind of deregulation, low tax, no tariffs, no no economic borders mm. version of turbo capitalism. Yeah, mm. I mean that's the brief. And yet, much of the journalistic discussion of Brexit was all about the left behind, mm. and it was all about um, Little England, which, of course, in the 19th century was quite liberal, of course, because it was anti-imperialist, yeah. but is now seen as a kind of dimwitted backwardness, sort of not being able to move. And I wondered, because it, so many of the narratives of Brexit were dealing with this other set of problems, and yet the actual driving interest of the people who were scheming and manipulating and 
finding money and doing all these things you've described so well. Um, then you get the feeling they don't care about any of that. They're not little nationalists. You know, they're already chopping around all over the world. They have a completely different vision. So how do those two come together? How do those two sides of this new politics come together? It's a really interesting question. One of the most fascinating books, well, actually, was, I can't remember who sent it to me a few years ago, it was a book called The Sovereign Individual, which was written by Jacob Rees-Mogg's father, William Rees-Mogg, uh, formerly editor of The Times, uh, who's a co-author of the, this book, The Sovereign Individual. And actually, Fintan O'Toole references it in his book, Heroic Failure, but actually the most interesting discussion on it is there's an epilogue to Dave, Gabriel Gatehouse's fantastic The Coming Storm podcast, which is all about the rise of QAnon, which uh, he has a he has a kind of he has a kind of um, uh, a kind of an epilogue where he asks loads of questions about about uh, Jacob Rees Mogg and the sovereign individual and, and the thesis of the sovereign individual is casting forward. It's kind of written at the dawn of the internet and it's casting forward into a kind of a, a world of sea standings. If you don't know the world, the sea standing world, which is the idea that like basically. In international waters, you, you, know, you can live a sovereign life in which your, your regulations don't exist and you don't pay taxes. But it's going beyond that and imagining some world where there's kind of almost a supermen, the, the, you know, the kind of supermen of the world who are unfettered by any demands of the state, any demands of, of kind of the bonds of nationhood for a few enlightened souls in this new tech utopia. You know, are able to do, and in some ways, that Jeff Bezos and Elon Musk of this world are, are kind of represents. This, you know, you can see it's in some ways quite a prescient book. It's not without its, but what's quite fascinating about it is the authors are delighted at this prospect. I think it's the thing that does come away with you from reading this book. And you know, fathers and sons aren't identical, but it's not hard to see some echoes of that in, in Jacob Rees Mogg's. I don't know how, how you know he's, as you say, he's you know the kind of large investment firms, footloose capital. It's very striking, actually, that, you know, this political shift, and I, and I think I kind of, I have a feeling we might go in this direction, which is one of the reasons I talked about political funding in my talk there. That shift in, in movement of where money came from, away from the kind of captains of industry of Tory vote, you know, from the 60s, say, which did at least have some bounds in the national economy, some bounds in the productive economy, into like the hedge fund world, into the world of deregulation and federal capitalism, where money can be made from chaos, where you know, what Naomi Klein calls disaster capitalism, is you know, there's, there is money to be made. And, and I wonder, I guess in some ways, the PPE contracts are a good example of disaster capital. That this, you know, when all the kind of usual rules of the game are thrown up in the air, there's, oppor there's huge opportunities to and make. This argument used to be, um associated with the left, mm. you know, the revolution that may cause mayhem, but will make a better world, the bright future will come out of it, that rhetoric. But now you're seeing the sort of, the principle of chaos, and sort of a uh, sense of global collapse, and being a sort of an opportunity to make money, to make more money. And in, the For, and in a way, I think there's a kind, it's, 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 similar, it's also framed, it's, it's quite striking. I think Jacob Rees-Mogg is genuinely quite, is an interesting character in that respect. You know, he is now the Minister for Brexit Opportunities, and it's easy to scoff at that, but if you actually listen to what he says, the one thing he talks about all the time is the City of London deregulations, getting rid of the Zor is getting rid of the Baal rules. That's a big thing, actually. Like, they are things that make a big difference, and that's you know, how much credit a bank has to hold. Like, you, get, you, start, you, know, you reduce that, there's a lot more money to be made, frankly, and, and, and money to be lost uh, subsequently. But also, I, I, without getting too determinist, deterministic on it, it is striking he's a very, very, he's a very doctrinaire Catholic. You know, um, and I was struck, oddly, as you can probably tell from my accent, I was, I was raised a Catholic. Um, I was struck, actually, just quite an interesting, I wouldn't over-labour it, but quite a number of, uh, of the strongest voices and say, the European Research Group are very religious. Much more religious than the norm in Britain. Normally, because I, 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 I often say that Britain's pleasingly godless. You know, it, religion doesn't play the same. You know, I remember when Theresa May became Prime Minister, she had to basically go, you know, nothing to do with me, the whole religion thing. And it's quite interesting. And I think there's, there's, a, there's a desire for social control at the same time as, you know, and so I think it's not just, it's, there's aspects that are both in terms of financial, but also there's a desire for control. And I think you can see that played out in America very, very strongly, actually. These two things which, you know, like, and you can actually see it in some of the libertarian, there's a kind of interesting kind of, you know, without, again, without laboring the point too much, the, you know, the kind of the, the Peter Thiels of this world, the PayPal billionaire, who actually, in many respects, is 
is very, very, very doctrinaire socially. So I think, you know, in some ways, there's both, there's a revolutionary aspect to this because it's, there's also often a story of moral decay. There's a story of making money and a story of moral decay, which are kind of locked in with each other. And I didn't speak about it there, but my book, there's a chapter in my book that talks about a group called the World Congress of Families, mm -hmm. which is a very fascinating organization. My colleagues at Open Democracy have done a lot of work in the World Congress of Families, which is a group that was set up by very, very right-wing American Christians and very, very conservative Russians around Putin, people like Konstantin Malefeyev. Yeah, and it kind of, it, I was, we published a few stories in the last couple of months about them, but I thought more people would in the back of the invasion of Ukraine. But what this group started up in the 90s was, you know, pushing very, very, very hard doctrinaire Christian lines, very close to Viktor Orban, a number of their annual conferences have taken place in Budapest. Matteo Salvini uh, addressed their co conference in Verona, I think it was 2018 or 2019, ahead of the European elections. And what you can see, I think, is, is a similar space, is a similar kind of, like, it's the internationalization of nationalism, a very strong focus on social control, but similarly, you know, so this, it's a series of interlocking narratives which are about, are kind of, in a, fun, in a way, tapping into some sort of revolutionary conversation as well. Unsurprisingly, the monetary aspect, which is what I focus on, is very often not the thing that's discussed. So that you rarely hear the conversation about the money flows and how the, you know, and how these, um, uh, how that side of these operations work. Now you, you've also taken in the book, you've taken, you've gone back quite a long way. You go back into the seventies. You, you mm. attach this uh, the politics of in this country we've seen around Brexit, um, and which other countries have seen in different manifestations. But you've attached it to the sort of post, well, the 70s attack on the state. Mm. Many of the same people are involved. So there's a sense in which people are, we're dealing with a kind of set of outriders of the Conservative Party, sometimes in, sometimes far mm. out, who have you know, worked to dismantle the post war settlement and all that supposed common culture yeah. that came out of 45, and who have then found Europe as an alternative to the domestic state, having sort of brought that into whatever shape they're prepared to be bored with that. Do you know what I mean? They've yeah. sort of moved on. So there is a kind of strong sequence here which runs through several decades. But you've also talked, interestingly, I think, about the, the media situation. Mm. So you've talked about, you've got Berlusconi in there mm. as an early example of a leader who decides there is a politics in just reinventing yourself but being invisible every day. A, a sort of truthless politics, if you like, but omnipresent. And you've also talked about Pepo Grillo, mm -hmm. the Five Star Movement. I thought maybe you could give us a sense of how this leads you into, a, into an analysis of what social media have done to politics. Because I think that's where it goes. Yeah, I, found, I actually found Pepo Grillo really fascinating, because I found myself... Because uh, this, this book was a product of... You know, it, was, it was written on the back of a lot of investigations. I actually written, frankly, pretty quickly. Um, in the second half of 2019. And then the pandemic slowed it all down, but that's the book was pretty much locked. And, and in a funny way, I think it was, it was uh, my previous book, as you, you mentioned there, but the Scottish book, which was 2014. So if you remember, the referendum was September 2014. With aspects of this book, I tapped into some stuff that I, had I spent a couple of years later, I might have missed that were better for being fresh. And they might have been manifestations I would dismiss as not being very important. And that's a precursor to kind of, it's almost like an apology, an ap apology for those who read the book and go, why is he writing about this? And what I mean is, I was really, I became very interested in this idea of the Brexit Party, which in retrospect looks like a nothing thing. It looks like a nothing burger. It's a kind of short lived, odd political movement that started Nigel Farage, purely a Brexit manifestation, tops the polls, disappears, you know, kind of, you can tie it to the story of one man as a disruptor. But I was very interested in it because and what I was interested in was this idea of a digital party. The party had no, like it was kind of like a fake digital party too, like it wasn't really online either, but like it had none of the manifestations of a normal political party. It had no members. It just, you, had to, you gave money into a PayPal account. Do you know, it was a kind of mo, you know, it was, in one level it was like, you know, kind of like pure spivery. But I was really interested in, in what, it felt like it was tapping into a different conversation. And that was a, this idea of a different place where politics could take place. And I was very interested in the work of um, Paolo Gerardo, who's at, um, I think he's at LSC, on, who's written a lot about digital parties as well, I think, which I thought was really interesting, this idea of like, where, where does politics go online? And the kind of er-digital parties, the five-star movement. The five-star movement initially, 
was, you know, kind of the first one. And I actually I've got to know him very well. Darren Lacadis wrote a great long read in the Guardian around the time of the European uh, election in 2019 about Farage and Pepe Grillo and the Five Star Movement and how Farage's interests in, were in them. And actually, Steve Bannon backed up a lot of what was in Darren's piece too. And Farage went to Milan and met the party. And it was really interesting because in, in the middle of all this, was the data was a big key to all this. It was all about harvesting data, really. It was almost like political parties as data harvesting operations. But also the ability to kind of like to present the digital party as being lots of, as a renewal of democracy. You know, we were all participating. This is a new manifestation of participation of democracy. Whereas in many respects, actually, what you end up with is, is an even more centralized control because it's kind of who controls the data, who's in control of the mechanisms, you know, who controls the, the whole mechanisms of the party actually controls everything because you do away with branches because you're all online. So it's a, it's a really fascinating manifestation. Like, you know, and the Five Star Movement has floundered for political reasons and, and the Brexit Party doesn't exist anymore. But I feel like there's still something really interesting in that. I find it hard to imagine that we, there won't be new iterations of this sort of digital party in which there's a huge amount of media manipulation of the image of the leader. There's a huge amount of ability to manipulate the kind of the conversations that go on. And that was one of the really interesting things about the Five Star Movement. If you see it with other political movements, so you see it in the online space, and far more even than when I wrote this book, where you, you have your outriders, you have your bots, you have all of these different you know, aspects of digital conversation that are used to, to kind of uh, to manipulate how politics operates. And I think that to me is, a, is, is something I think is fascinating because there's the scope, you know, it's, there's a kind of aspect for everything in journal where you, you know, you, you can only you only you only measure you can only me you, know, you can only know what you can measure and in the same way that like we now report a lot about what Facebook what people spend on Facebook ads journalists do I've done it too because there's a there's an ad library that you can use but there's actually a whole other world of social media and of politics that's happening that is actually really hard to keep track of really hard to understand what's operating in it and I think I was really struck by the five star movements. Genesis, how it had come forward, how it operated, and I, I feel like within that, there's opportunities to pick up some of these different building blocks and kind of reconfigure them in new ways. <clears throat> Last question for me. Um, your book is interesting partly because I really have a view to understanding Putin. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I like so many of us. I like to know who's taking the money. Is the dark money from Putin? How much? Of it? Uh, reading your book, I realised that a great deal of it, of course, is not from Britain. Mm. A lot of it is from within this country. Yeah. And a lot of it also, a great deal of it is from what you or they, that you describe, called the Anglosphere, mm. comes in from America. Yeah. So were you surprised by the way that worked out? I mean, the way the quantities played out, or the degree of influence? No, because what, what's interesting is influence, like, it depends where, you're, where, where you are connected into the system of influence, if that makes sense. I think how... Like the inter how international, like what it is you're trying to ascertain, what you're trying to get. So like in Britain, like we invited in huge amounts of Russian money. Some of it went into politics, but most of it went into the entire kind of enabling industry, you know, PR, lobbyists, state agents, law in a huge way, all of that. Like, um, so that became, that's where a lot of the money ended up. So it ended up, it kind of often ended up in the back pockets of politicians, but in a quite a circuitous way. They might have, like, like a number of members of the House of Lords, gotten on the board of you know, large Russian interests and, and received money in that way. Similarly, the Saudis don't invest in British politics, but they have huge sway in other ways. We, you know, the arms industry and the Saudis are completely and utterly interlinked. So there's huge other ways in which, which political influence happens. Um, and so what, what, what then kind of struck me is like, you know, how, as you say, money from the Anglosphere, money from people who look out towards that direction, you know, how much, uh, how great that was. But even since I've written my book, what I'm also increasingly struck by is the kind of like random spivery, frankly, of a lot of our major political donors. Like if you look at the biggest donors, the Tory party now, like, a lot of them are people you've never heard of. Some of them are people you couldn't find. Some of them are people who don't, they take advantage, so the Conservative Party takes advantage of um, 
they've intentionally they've never changed this. They've, they don't they won't let the electoral commission change it. You're not only British citizens or, or Irish citizens can donate. We have to we have to British citizenship or uh, be a dual national to be able to donate to a political party. But a British registered company can donate. A British registered company doesn't actually have to do any trading in Britain to to, uh, to, uh, to donate to political parties. So I, I, you can set up a company on your phone now in about half an hour. And you have to do that, and then you can donate to political parties. So quite a huge amount of money now goes through companies to uh, British political parties. And frankly, it is mainly the Conservative Party. So there's a kind of like, it's an, a constantly evolving thing, I think, is the really interesting and important part of it. But when it comes to things like, I think what we've seen with the invasion of Ukraine, since the invasion of Ukraine, is this kind of like, I, I've been, even I've been slightly shocked with the, I can't believe this is going on. You know, like you know, I can't believe you know rich Russians used Britain to launch their reputation. Like, have you walked around London? Have you seen? You know, have you watched a football match? You know, like this has been a huge like so like and I think that's it's about thinking about influence in ways like political donations is one form of influence, but there's lots of other forms of influence that will kind of change and like I think like frankly massively corrupt the body politic. <laughs> Thank you. I really have a question. Can you write to Take the conversation with the director. Yes, please. Do I need my Thank you very much. I enjoyed that. Um, and I just want to pick up on a very interesting point I think you made in the discussion about religion. I mean, maybe I would ask this question. But, um, uh, and Rhys Mogg and the Catholicism and the type, I should say, of Catholicism, the, this, the, the rhetoric of Catholicism that goes with it. Because you, I think you're absolutely right. In this country, or let's just say England for now, uh, you have to have a kind of decaffeinated religion. It's nice, tolerant, sweet, nothing too much. None of the details, none of the ritual, none of that crazy stuff, you know. Um, um, but there's an exception. One of the exceptions was Thatcher, and it's this anti-establishment establishment kind of thing, isn't it? That you can come as an outsider using it. But I think... The interesting thing was, Rees Mogg is interesting because where it's failed religion was Tim Farron. As soon as he starts talking about all this stuff, he was out. Um, but Rees Mogg was making a very, very similar argument on same-sex marriage, but it didn't hurt him whatsoever. And, and, and I've seen this certain type of Catholicism. I, that's why I don't want to generalize, obviously, about Catholicism. On sort of in alt-right circles, this, uh, and, and it's worked somehow. And, and, I, and I can't quite put my finger on why. Um, but I think it's because you can deflect to the church and Rome. Every time there's a problem, you say, well, I just agree with the church's point on this. And no one's going to criticize that in Parliament. No, there's not enough anti-Catholicism, if you like, in, in British politics to be able to say something like that. But it's a phenomenon. But it, I think that's, that's as best I can do as an explanation. That there is that sort of protection to bat it off. Whereas Farron had to say, well, the Bible says. And then everyone can just pile in and says, well, what about this verse in the Bible? But the Catholic Church gives you that protection, or the rhetoric, I should say, of the Catholic Church gives you that kind of protection, I think. So the other thing that's striking is they're mainly Anglo-Catholics, which is quite strange. There are not many Irish Catholics. They're almost all Anglo. So you've got, you've got Ian Duncan Smith who's Anglo-Catholic as well. I think Liam Fox is an Anglo-Catholic. You know, given that most of the Catholicism in the country is Irish, you know, it, you know, it's quite striking. Like it's yeah, it's working. Yeah, it's mainly Irish and working class. There's you know, there's a lot of Catholic. You know, not not Anglo. You know, Anglo Catholicism is not a massive strain of the Catholic Church, but it's quite in this country. So it's quite. In, there's some, I think there's something in it. Steve Baker is a born again Christian. I wouldn't be labour too far, but there is something within it that I do think it's because it, and partly I think because it does speak to, to some of these divides in 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 America too. And I don't think we're on the cusp. Like, it, what's interesting is that I think it's allowed views and positions that in, in the scheme of British politics are really, really quite fringe. Like on issues like abortion, which in some ways are just not, even in the, you know, the conservative right are not issues. To kind of have some, I think this, and I'm not totally sure, you know, I wouldn't, as I say, I wouldn't overdo it, but there's something, I think there's something interesting in it. I took a look a few months ago at the membership of the ERG, I Thought, I thought they would all be male Conservative MPs. Yeah, and most of them were, but there were also about 10, maybe not 10, about 10 female Conservative MPs. 
And most of them were either Catholic or in their little blurb on Wikipedia or whatever it was, they wanted to talk about their religiosity and how important that was to them. Or they were the other, the other two or three were from the Asian community. Uh, so it was a kind of it was a set of women who I think hardly any of them were straightforward, you know, uh, white British women of the Protestant, you know, and, and the one or two that were were, were very clear about their personal religiosity. So, and if you go back to the um, the early 19th century, I'm a historian, the, um, the era of when the new poor law was created, uh, which was a kind of movement away from more traditional ideas of mercy and charity being what Christians were about. It's clear that, I mean, there were two or three strong ideological strands behind that, one of which was political, classical political economy, one of which was Benthamite utilitarianism. But another one was a strand of providential evangelicalism of which uh, William Sumner, who later became Archbishop of Canterbury, sat on the Royal Commission, and he was a key figure holding that view. And these were people who thought that the sort of the economic sphere, and they understood it through the new ideas of political economy, was a sort of moral testing ground for, for, for individuals. And, you know, those who did not work for a living engaged had failed morally, and, uh, you know, they had to be rescued, but they were, you know, and those who did work industriously and well and who created wealth, well, they were the saved. They were, so, so I'm, I'm, I'm sure it's not exactly the same uh, ideology today, but one can see, um, you know, seeing as we've got the workhouse back, or as I think Philip Alston called it, the digital workhouse, um, you know, there may be that there is some of that kind of thinking that is going on. Did you have a question here? Hi, thanks for your uh, excellent talk. I, I'm Jason Pack. I've written a book, Libya and the Global Enduring Disorder, which it was funny to hear so many of the themes of my book uh, with a slightly different accent. But uh, I have two, two questions. And the first is, you've touched on, I would say, the core principle of, of my work, which is a range of interconnected, both sovereign actors as well as individuals and non-state groups, as well as multinational corporations, who benefit from disorder. And the political ways in which, say, Putin or Orban or Bolsonaro or Trump benefit from disorder are well covered, and we need not rehash them. You said something on the economic front with re which resonates with certain things that my research has uncovered. You talked about ways in which hedge funds might benefit from a quote-unquote disaster capitalism. And of course, this is very paradoxical to lay people because obviously something like Brexit or Trump did not improve the economies of the United States or US. And, and if you're in a spider fund, your, your funds have not gone up. I'm not completely convinced by the argument of the benefit of disaster capitalism is for corrupt access to contracts, although for some individuals it may be. You talked about ways in which volatility in and of itself, and you could see some certain kinds of quants and high volume traders might benefit. So I wanted to ask, and because this is a long question, I'll stop with one, um, unless there's more time later. What kind of a hedge fund in specific would benefit from this more disordered universe? And I'm not talking about deregulation, but actually the huge volatility of, say, the pound that we're experiencing or the events in Ukraine and the price of Brent crude changing so rapidly? It's a really interesting question. And I think when I was writing this book and I was kind of reflecting on some of this, so there's a famously, um, there's a guy called Crispin Aldi who was actually married to Rupert Murdoch's daughter. And he used to be a Tory, I think, a Tory donor. But he'd been, and interesting, this is a side, actually. A lot of the same actors who were involved with the Vote Leave campaign were involved with the No to AV campaign back in 2011. He's very similar tactics. And Odie's one, 
one of the, the, the donors to that, and he, he, I think he spent about £900,000 on the Brexit referendum. But famously, there was a, they, I think it was BBC or Channel 4, made a film on the referendum night, and they interviewed various people. And he made a fortune shorting Sterling on the night of the referendum, because the pound collapsed. And so he was kind of headed as a poster boy of like, kind of, like, you know, the kind of, a kind of, a, that sort of world, this kind of capitalism that doesn't care about anything else. But there's also, and I think there's some truth to that, but also there's something about characters in hedge funds that's quite interesting as well, as, as people hedge funds. The, the people who are hedge fund hedgies, they're not, in, say, in the city of London, they're not the pinstripe city boys. They're rarely the people who went to Oxford, or to Eton and Harrow. So they kind of sit outside and have a tendency to see themselves in quite iconoclastic terms. They see themselves as almost masters of disorder. So there's a kind of self, there's a self-fulfilling prophecy aspect to it too. So there's a personality aspect, I think, to some extent, where hedge fund hedges and hedge fund managers do tend to see themselves in a different way to your kind of spider fund, your traditional kind of Goldman Sachs banker type. And so there's probably, you know, and I think that's quite important. I think there's an element in which there's profit to be made from it, and they feel like we can make money from volatility, and they feel like there's money to be made within volatility. But also, there's a kind of personalised story of I am the I'm the disruptor, I am the master of my own narrative, and I'm a disruptor, and I'm disrupting this. You know, I'm disrupting what's going on around me, and I feel confident I can profit in it. I'm not one of the little guys, and somebody who's you know. So there's, I feel like there's a couple. There's a kind of interesting personal. I'm not. I'm totally agreeing in terms of like, you know, the kind of the profit from disorder side of things. And I think when it comes to things like volatility, certain hedge funds with certain positions, and there's also just, there is money to be made in, in frankly, hedging. So like, for example, Jacob Rees-Mogg, so I think Somerset Investment, which is based over in Victoria, they opened a, a Dublin branch about 12, two, 24 months before uh, Brexit. So there's the opportunity to kind of, to sit in different spaces. And what you're looking, I often think like, what you're looking for now as an outcome is often, not one defined outcome. I think that's where often when people think about money in politics. I think you're right, actually. The contracts is kind of like, it's probably a segue I use because it's quite an interesting story. I think that's rarely what money in politics is about. It's rarely about a one-for-one -one translation. It's more often about setting the world in, in a place where you think it is. So I think it's rarely about this particular type of volatility I want. It's a particular type of world I want for a bunch of different reasons, some of which can actually be personal as well as political, if that makes sense. Do you have any, any, have you got anything from the feed? Sorry, it's just, are there any questions there? Never mind. <laughs> <laughs> okay, good. Were you, were you going to start? I'm going to move on just quickly, yes. Thank you very much. Um, I'm not sure I've got a fully formed question, but I'll, I'll put something together. Um, all of these, all of these um, political movements and themes were heavily contested. Um, in all sorts of different ways. So Brexit, as we know, uh, these different uh, agendas and narratives really around the nature of Europe and the nature of Britain. And, and the same for net zero, I guess it's moving in that direction now, these narratives. Um, and I, I just wonder whether, um, sort of reflecting on people who, who joined millenarian movements in history, etc., there's a moment that comes when an individual who is not benefiting in any practical way makes a decision to give up everything they have and join a movement and, uh, and, and the, the Brexit especially was a case of, of people in ballot boxes making a vote who, you know, many of them were not picking up many money from this process. I just wonder whether the focus on money, first of all, um, de-emphasizes the importance of these ideas, the contestation around ideas, and not just that, the contestation around imagination about, um, in the materialized study often, what the, what the world can be like, but maybe just about what, what Britain could be like or what Europe could be like. And, and do we miss something if we, if we emphasize the money too much, which, um, you know, at the end of the day, the, thing, the person in the ballot box or the person going net zero or changing their boiler or spending money doing that, is, um, is, that's what presumably plays on their mind. I think it's a very, and I, I would, you know, I kind of say it to start, like, I think the reason I ended up doing this is because I felt like actually this wasn't been written about. And in some ways when I started writing about this, this wasn't something people were writing about enough, I felt. You know, I felt like we had so many stories about the red man and the red wall or, you know, the, the kind of, the, a very stereotyped vision of that too. I felt like I saw a lot of Vox Pops outside, like working men's clubs in Sutton Coldfield and none in the golf club in Seven Oaks where most people voted for Brexit too. So I was quite, I, I think there is something in that. 
But the counterpoint about the materiality is, I think, what you're talking about is, especially when it comes to, like, the materiality is also a product of the idea space that exists around it. And like, so we, you, you mentioned, to kind of go backwards, you talked about my, I talk about the 70s and stuff that happened in the book quite a lot. And as a, I'm slightly fascinated by a man called Anthony Fisher. Anthony Fisher is a guy who set up the Atlas Network, he set up the IEA, he set up about, four, he set up about 500 think tanks over the course of his life. He was a British man who ended up moving to America. And Anthony Fisher was uh, just post-war 1950s. Um, Fisher and a guy called Major Smedley, Major George Smedley, who was an army veteran. This was a time when the Conservatives, this is a long-winded answer, but I'll get there, uh, when the Conservatives and Labour were both very much in favour of state intervention. There was a kind of consensus, the post-war consensus, and he didn't like this at all. He was like, he, he said it was anti-free market. And he went to see um, uh, Frederick Hayek, the famous Austrian economist who was at LSE. And he said to Hayek, I'm thinking about getting involved in politics. You know, what should I do? And Hayek said, don't, don't be stupid. Don't get involved in politics. It's a waste of time. Why do you want to be standing out, parroting what someone else says to you? What you want to be is getting the ideas that are on the table. You want to be the person, you know, whose ideas are being parroted, not the other way around. What you should do is you should set up a think tank. You set up a think tank and you push out these ideas, you know, and, and you put them out into the world. And that was, that was Fisher's, you know, Fisher created... A, a panoply of same things that all said the same thing, in different flavours, but pretty, pretty much exactly the same thing. Like the answer to every problem was the same thing, and those ideas took a long time to percolate. There was, you know, every 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 I think, couple of weekdays, the IEA through the sixties and seventies would have MPs and influential people come for lunch. They would meet with other people, etc. You get newspaper columnists. It takes a long time. For, the, for ideas to percolate out. Keith Joseph was a big aficionado of them. Adam Curtis does a very good job in the Mayfair set of mapping some of this work. And what's fascinating, I think, um, the reason I can say all this is that my materiality and ideas matter. The curly sandwiches at half two in the afternoon matter. Whoever's, someone has to foot the bill. Like, and this is my point. Like, like sometimes it's tiny amounts of money which make a big difference. So I, there's a chapter in a book about the European Research Group, which was this kind of moribund thing for 20 years. I interviewed a bunch of the old members, Tory MPs, and just every so often it was a research paper. Then they hired a couple of pretty whizzy um, uh, research associates who didn't do any research, but knew how the media worked. And next thing you know, they were all over the place. And I think it's, it is important. I think like there's almost, there's in, you need to fuel that imagination. Those imaginations you're talking about, the fuel of those comes from somewhere. They're the ideas. And so you, if you can afford to be, the per, to be there with the ideas, to have, and it doesn't take a huge amount of architecture, but if you, so there's, there's, that's what I'm interested in. So it's not all, it, money is part of it, but it's not, and it's not always purely for a vested interest. You should never, the one thing I will say is, you shouldn't underestimate how many people just do believe in things. They get money because they do believe in the thing. Like money is, off, is less at times the reason why someone believes in something. And not always, you know, it can be the facilitator for someone who believes in the thing anyway, but it can also then facilitate lots of other people believing in it too. Is it, is it also true that um, most of the ideologies that the 20th century lived by are completely Yeah, they're completely, what's they're, they're really, yeah. I mean, you know, people pretend they're still there, yeah. but they're not. No, and well, that's what kind of was, so oh, oh yeah. Meaning is, meaning is very volatile, yeah. meaning is important, but it's also very, why? I found it right in this book too, even how you describe it, like, does Thatcherite work anymore? There's actually in steam, like, writing about these kind of libertarian think tanks, libertarian doesn't work at all as a word for them, it doesn't work. I don't, and I don't really know why, like, and like dark money think tanks, which is true because they don't declare their funders, which is one of my big things, it just feels such a kind of jaundiced way of talking about them. So I really struggle to know what to say about them, so I say Tufton Street. But to call this Thatcherism, it probably isn't really on most, most people. So Steen Westlake is who's now at the Royal uh, Statistical Society and, and would be kind of from, from the right of the Conservative Party at one level or economically at one point, talks about kind of cosplay Thatcherism. I think there is something in that because you're right, these ideas are, you know, and you see it with this government now. There's a, the government's a weird and holy mix of people talking about like, you know, we need to get cut 25% of civil service so we can have tax cuts. You know, how does that work? You know, and like, it does as a kind of weird hodgepodge of things that are supposed to, you know, and no, I think it is. I think there's a kind of, I think that's where the other thing we were talking about, the sense of, for some, the sense of some idea of what the future looks like that is also bound in with some ideas of social control is actually quite compelling for some. 
Good. Are we, have we got any more questions or observations? Or did you, I don't know, yes, what's that? This is not my field at all, but um, thinking of the relationship between what that gentleman referred to, the person in the voting booth, um, in relation to dark money, I mean, well, a few of us here anyway are, are getting on a bit. Uh, not everybody, I'm pleased to <laughs> but uh, And we probably are old school and maybe even read newspapers and take time to uh, research subjects. But the, the vast majority of those actually now in, in polling booths are a new generation and the one below who, whose information on the whole is coming from what we call social media. So he who pays the piper plays, you know, um, uh, plays the tune. Okay, I've got that wrong. Thank you. <laughs> in other words... Um, You've referred to social media. It's a massive subject. Um, but the presumably the bots are funded uh, as much as the, you know, the people who are putting out this stuff and the stuff goes to people who've already read that stuff and so on and so on and so on. So um, my question is really, is that... In the end, is that where the money is most effective? Because this is not just the future, it's the present, this type of influence. What may be happening in the corridors of Westminster is one thing, but in the um, village halls of voting booths, uh, where is the information coming from? Because some of the traditional um, catchment areas for the traditional political parties have, have, have really disappeared. Certainly true that a lot of, as you said, traditional catchment areas political parties have. I think in some ways the, the age thing is quite interesting because if you look at it like, you know, a lot of older voters take in a lot of misinformation on places like Facebook too. So I don't think it's necessarily just a simple kind of uh, young and old um, thing. I think certainly what what you've seen, I think, and you see it in politics, but you see it in other spheres as well, you know, the creation of, of, you know, of echo chambers and filter bubbles within which you know, lots of political conversation happens in, in certain very pronounced ways. Um, I think we're still, we're still, unfortunately, very much in the infancy of what the internet's going to do to our politics. You know, and like what, that's why I think one reason I end up writing something about the digital party, like this interest in thinking, trying to think through what does the internet mean to politics? What does it mean to what a political conversation looks like? How, again, as you said, like how, how is money spent online? What's the kind of things that you see? You see actually during, we see a lot of it actually during the Russia, in, in Russia, Ukraine, uh, in, during the war, we're seeing a lot of kind of online disinformation happening. But often I think it is important, it, it often links with other types of media too, like old media coalesces with new media, like influencers coalesce with like traditional ways of doing things. And I think that to me is still, the kind of thing that is, you know, there's still an imprimatur that comes from, say, getting your story into a newspaper and into a news outlet. But the mechanisms why this happens are really quite hollow and are becoming hollower and hollower as, as the media industry becomes hollower and hollower. So that in some ways they can kind of start to meet each other in not a very good way at all. And I think this, that to me is, is a big part of it. And also we lack, you know, when it comes, there's a couple of interesting books out now on social media, but like, how we even think about the role of what we call platforms, but really they're more like shopping malls, and they, they attract people in and they keep them there, and how they influence what you know, the kind of words like the, you know, the extent to which algorithms, different algorithms, can influence what people see. That's a huge, huge issue. You know, that's and I think that to me is as big an issue as anything to do with like illegal act or illicit or inauthentic behaviour on social media. It's the power of you know tech platforms that have very little oversight of any on how our world is run. Peter. Thank you very much indeed. That's been very interesting. I think, I think we, have to, we have to assume that our democracy staggers on. <laughs> um, we don't quite know how or why, where the renewal will come from. But it's a very interesting body of work. I would really recommend the book if anybody wants to chase up more of this. And um, thank you all for coming. And we'll continue. Those of us who are here in the old-fashioned way will
Oh, there's a glass of wine and some water at the back, and we can perhaps continue the conversation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.